So last night, Brian began us in Ezekiel 34, giving a very strong warning against being abusive shepherds. And I'm glad that came before this talk because I share Brian's concern that some of the spirit of the false shepherds of Israel and of the Pharisees can creep in, not just in churches with terrible doctrine, but even in churches with excellent doctrine. And we need to ourselves be careful not to be abusive, bullying leaders. Uh, and we need to do what we can to protect others from such leaders as well. So fair enough. We began with ourselves, getting the logs out of our own eyes as leaders. Well, I've been assigned the task now of dealing with difficult sheep. Sometimes the shepherd's the difficult one, but often there are sheep who are difficult as well. And the position I'm in, I guess, has given me a lot of experience in helping very discouraged pastors. Uh, I've had interns in our church in Escondido for 26 years. I keep in touch with many of them. And when things get really hard, like Jeff said today, he'll call me when things get challenging. Not that you guys are any trouble at all, but uh, he'll call and talk about a challenging situation. And so through that, I'm a bit of a magnet of many people, many men who are now in ministry and missionary work and some of the challenges they face. And now that I'm in Charlotte with RTS, there is a whole network of reformed pastors in North and South Carolina who, whom I've get, been getting to know. And then when they're in trouble, many of them have been coming to me. And actually, as I was preparing this talk, uh, there was a PCA pastor in our region who has a pretty healthy church of a couple hundred people. But he had an elder leave, and he's got people who grumble against him. And he's had some challenges in his family. My wife and I have actually counseled him and his wife, and they're doing better than they were, much better. But he wanted to quit. <laughs> and I had to talk him off the ledge because he was ready to pack it all in. Actually, his associate pastor had to be removed for cause. His former intern, who he wanted to hire, turned him down. He's overwhelmed. And I've heard some of you say since we've been here, the last year and a half with COVID has been the hardest year and a half for some of us of our entire lives. And we've gone through the worship wars over choruses, verse, and hymns. We've gone through all the different challenges. We brought our churches to reform theology or covenant theology or new covenant or whatever you tried to bring them to. But somehow these controversies over masks and no masks and vaccines or no vaccines and meet outside, meet inside, spread out, they have been so destructively divisive to churches and churches that could agree on the doctrines of grace and eschatology and everything else you can imagine are split down the middle, actually not done, into three pieces. You're too strict, you're not strict enough, and then a hand play, you're getting it pretty good. And it's been so disheartening. And there have been people blogging and writing articles how all these pastors are going to quit. And um, Anyway, so I'll also confess that normally when I'm invited to speak somewhere because of my other responsibilities, I try to get people to have me speak about stuff I've already done before. And when this topic was assigned, I didn't have anything that just fit. So I actually had to work on a new message <laughs> for tonight. And so... I don't think it's the best message I've ever prepared, but it's the best title I've ever prepared. You've seen it. 15 people who will want to make you quit the ministry and 15 reasons why you shouldn't, essentially, is going to be the second part, which gives me about 40 seconds per point if I extend this introduction any longer. Actually, it's now going to be 16 people. I came up with another one at lunch. but uh, um, And so I want to... I'm going to be bouncing around to different passages, but 2 Timothy 2 is written uh, to address this. I should mention also that as I was trying to do some extra reading, there are two resources that helped me. One was at the Reformed Baptist Network uh, meeting. Baruch spoke on a similar topic, and I took some really good notes, and I'm going to quote him once or twice. And there may be things I don't remember I got from him as well. So, And then also there's a book. There are a lot of copies over there, Pastors and Their Critics with Joel Beakey and Nick. Thompson. I found that to be very helpful as well. 
And then Brian's already mentioned lectures to my students by Spurgeon, and I'll be referencing that some as well. But I want to read 2 Timothy 2, the other passages to which we turn. But Paul says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlists him as a soldier. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descended of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not imprisoned. For this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it eternal glory." It is a trustworthy statement. If we died with him, we also will live with him. If we endure, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself as approved to God, as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead only to further ungodliness. And their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows who are his, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. Now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. But refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Amen. Um, even today, in our church, I'm an elder of a church in Charlotte area, Reformed Baptist Fire Church. Uh, I've been, in the last couple of days, in contact with my fellow elders as we've had key people in the church who have been stirring up division that is, has the, not the senior pastor, the preaching pastor, whatever we want to call him, not the lead pastor either, but one of our pastors. In tears, uh, we have a leader who is resigning because he's just, I don't know what, maybe he's just had it. Uh, all these things going on, it, it just, it is so hard. When Hebrews 13, 17 is speaking to the people, it's interesting, it's tonight when the people from the church are here to hear all the things you do that drive your pastors crazy. Um, you know, when you're told to obey your leaders and submit to them, they keep watch over your souls as those who will give account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. I mean, one thing that comforts me in the passage I just read, and I'm going to keep you know, going with specific examples, is that None of what's happening should surprise us because it was happening in the early church. There were people bringing grief to pastors and elders and uh, divisions and all these other things. So um, anyway, the, describing the now 16 people who may tempt you to quit, and I'm just going to rattle through these because really what you need is the solution. You'll just say, yeah, I've, I have had that common experience with you. Um, it's a little comforting. Misery loves company. That's one thing people like at fire conferences sometimes. <laughs> So I've just categorized some. I, I tried to be clever initially to make them all begin with C, but I'm just not John MacArthur. I can't do that. Especially alliterating three points is one thing. 16 is really hard. Um, anyway, one is just the demanding consumer. The person who comes to your church and they want programs, and if you don't get this certain ministry going right now, they're going to leave. I remember the early days of our church, we had a little batch of people who wanted a youth group. And so we got a guy, we're going to have him, you know, get him dedicated to that. And, 
And like they gave us two weeks and they left anyway. Um, it's the person who, you know, you're running a corner grocery and they want to shop at Walmart or Amazon. They want you to be a full service church and do everything that you can't do. It's the person who, you know, they come to the church and immediately they want you to meet them at 5.30 a.m. to fit their work schedule every week to disciple them at breakfast or really they want to disciple you. Um, it's people where you've counseled them through crisis after crisis and uh, when they run into financial trouble, you pay their mortgage, you buy them a new refrigerator and then they call you and, or actually they just stop showing up and then you find out they've gone somewhere else. Baruch said, this is the way it is. People will use you and then they will turn their back on you. It's just going to happen. People are consumers. They're looking for a better deal. Although I'll say on the other hand, if you've never been taken advantage of, you're probably too cautious. Jesus got taken advantage of. The other one I've called the dissatisfied spiritual widower. And this is the person that comes to you from some other place, usually. And they're always talking about their former pastor, their former church. Or maybe they're even like members online and they've got their hero that they listen to every week. And you're like the second husband of the widow and, and she has pictures of her first husband all over the house and she's always talking about him as the ideal husband. And he, she never says much about you. You're, you're tolerable maybe. But, and you're always being compared that you know, you're just not Spurgeon, you're just not Piper, you're just not MacArthur, all true. They are perpetually disappointed in you for not measuring up. It's hard to be around people who are perpetually disappointed. And then there's the uncommitted dating and waiting. Uh, there are some people who just never believe in commitment and they want all the benefits of membership without any of the commitment and responsibility. It's the analogy somebody gave us like living together without putting a ring on her finger. Um, others call, I think Jim Ellis said it's like hitchhikers. They, they, they're gonna, not going to pay for the gas and they're going to criticize your driving. Um, <laughs> Or they're looking for a certain kind of church. We're waiting for nine marks or somebody from Masters or somebody from this, that, or the other to come in. And so you're kind of Mr. Right now where they're waiting for Mr. Right to come along. And if Mr. Right ever does come to town to plant a church, they're not only going to leave you, they're going to try to drag as many of your people with them as possible. Uh, the sheep who wander from flock to flock and they come to you and they're telling you how wonderful your church is. Boy, you're such a better preacher than the last guy. Everything about your church is better. They love you. You're their hero. Proverbs says, the flatterer is spreading a net for your feet. Later the honeymoon is over. Uh, and I, it really hurts. And I've had this experience a lot for some reason lately. People who once looked at me as a hero now look at me as a zero. And the person who just admired you and flattered you and told you how great you were, now, I don't know, they got tired of the grass on your side of the fence and you're nothing. Um, and a couple of years later, they'll go to the next place and flatter somebody else. The unengaged and distracted, you know, Hebrews 10 says in 25, don't forsake assembling. And these are people who they join, but they've got soccer one weekend, drama the next weekend, all these activities. If they were half as committed to the church as they were to children's programs, they would be amazing. Uh, but these are the people when you cancel something, they, you cancel the evening service because nobody comes, or you cancel this certain program, they're first to complain, how dare you cancel this thing I never come to? Which gets to the complainer and the grumbler. This is one, I, I've never quoted this to somebody, but when 1 Corinthians 10.10 10 talks about don't grumble as some did and they were destroyed in the desert, in the wilderness. Uh, Paul warns about the grumbling in Philippians 2. And you know, what's the main complaint you get about sermons? You're going to say I'm right. It's not what you said. It's you didn't say his thing enough, right? It's the complaining about the thing you left out. That's the problem. You didn't emphasize redemption enough. You didn't emphasize obedience enough. It wasn't practical enough. Not enough about politics. Not enough about critical race theory. Too much about critical race theory. And you know, everything else. Complaining about mask policies, finances. Um, these are also people who complain. I just don't have any friends in this church. Well, they get here five minutes after the service starts. They leave during the final hymn. They don't answer phone calls. They're not hospitable. But they'll go find a more friendly church. Good luck. And then the, the critic, and I've got to admit, this is something, dare I speak his name here? I, I got the idea from John Riesinger many years ago where he said he had a deacon he called Shimei. And <laughs> some of you know the reference. 
And this is where David, he's on the run. This is after actually the story I talked about this morning. Absalom's taking over the kingdom. David's running for his life. And as he's going, there's a man in verse 5 of 2 Samuel 16. It says, a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera, he came out and cursing continually as he came, he threw stones at David and all the servants of the king David and all the people and all the mighty men were his right hand and his left. Then Shimei said when he cursed, get out, get out, you man of bloodshed and worthless fellow. The Lord has returned upon you all the bloodshed of the house of Saul in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has given your kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. And behold, you are taken in your own evil for you are a man of bloodshed. You know that guy? And part of it is, do you ever mess up? Yes, you do. Do you ever say things you wish you hadn't said? Do you ever make bad decisions? Yes, we all do. Well, this is the guy that's just waiting to spring when that happens. And he will pile on when you are down. And he'll say, and you know, there are many, many other people in our church who feel exactly the same way. Well, have them come to me. <laughs> uh, sometimes this can be the cage stage zealot, I've kind of talked about, you're not riding his hobby horse significantly enough. Um, this is also the person sometimes that they're passionate about whatever doctrine and some visitor comes and they want to try to argue with this person about critical theory or justice or whatever it is they're all excited about. There are also a lot of music critics in our congregation, not those who listen to the symphony and give opinions, but too much, you know, too many guitars, too much traditional stuff. I don't like the screen. I like the hymn books. I don't like the hymn books. Um, James Denny writes, the natural man loves to find fault. It gives him at the cheapest rate the comfortable feeling of superiority. Um, sometimes this can be the financial critic as well, where we pay you too much. And they see your gross salary on the budget, which everybody on earth now knows what you make. What they don't realize is they have an employer who's paying their social security, their other benefits, their retirement, their medical, um, and you're having people over all the time. When you buy a different car, they look it up in Blue Book to make sure you didn't spend too much. Even more difficult is the goats who fall away when John says they were among us, but they were never really of us. If they were with us, they would have remained with us. And Paul grieves over some who fell away. You have such hope. And again, many, they come to the church. We don't see many people get converted. They, get, they seem to be converted. We baptize them. Uh, you counsel them. You, and then they go back to their adultery, drunkenness, uh, abuse. The parable of the soils is lived out. And the soils that get choked out grieve us deeply. I was talking to Jeff earlier when I, my first one of my first ministries was leading a high school group when I was 21, and there were three guys I discipled. And one became a horrible husband, left his wife, and left the faith. One just became kind of an atheist, and one is still in the same church 42 years later. Three kinds of soil, that, and then the rocky soil. Uh, I mean, the, the hard path. Um, but it, it breaks your heart just the same. And then the, the, the sheep who just bite. <laughs> um, this is the, the biting slander. Paul says of Alexander the coppersmith, 414, did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. We don't know all that, what it was, but people who take your words and twist them. Uh, again, I'm thinking of real cases where there's a lady, she's, she's a drunkard. You spend hours and hours trying to work with her, plead with her, pray with her. Uh, finally, you learn that she's been driving around super drunk with a three-year-old in the car. You are a mandated reporter. This is gross neglect of a child. Well, she starts telling a story to everybody in the church who will listen, how abusive and mean and cruel you are, and people leave as a result. Um, you know, people who are like Ham, when you do mess up, I'm not saying you should be drunk and naked like Noah was, but they want to parade it in front of everybody rather than having mercy. Spurgeon also points out in lectures to my students, sometimes the slander comes from other churches and other pastors. A competitive spirit. Um, there was a situation in Escondido where there was a, an associate pastor at a large influential church who was spreading a rumor that I basically said, if any man struggles in the least bit with lust, his wife can divorce him for any cause. It was wrong, and yet it was going on. People were saying, well, you don't want to get counseling from him. 
Uh, in that case, I went and chatted with him and, and the senior pastor. <laughs> and then there are the, the disappearing sheep. Um, in John 6, this is a passage, a lot of great things in it, but when Jesus taught certain things, verse 66, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with them anymore. Um, and Jesus even said to the others, are you going to leave too? Where the people, again, they were there, they were enthusiastic, and then, and then suddenly they're gone. You, you call them, you send emails, uh, you feel like you're a bill collector, they're avoiding you. I mean, if they see you in the grocery store, they turn the other way and run. And then if finally you can corner them and say, well, what happened? And they'll give you a reason, and then they'll tell everybody else some other reason. And then the pastor wannabe. The shepherd who, will not, who cannot find sheep that want to follow him. So instead, he will be in your church to spread dissatisfaction among your sheep. He's perhaps a Diotrephes who wants to be first, but can't find anyone to dominate. And I actually had an experience at a conference uh, several months ago, a few months ago, actually, in another state. I won't say exactly where. Not that far from here. <laughs> anyway, uh, where a man, I spoke, and this a little bit older man came up to me and immediately after I'd poured out my heart for two or three hours he launches into me for something I didn't emphasize enough in his opinion and I tried to give a gentle answer I'll talk about how you respond to criticism a little later and then he came and I said I need your counsel so why is that he says well my pastor doesn't really listen to me very well I'm saying did you used to be a pastor yeah how did you know and do you always criticize his sermons? I'm just trying to help him. That's probably not how it's coming across. Because <laughs> uh, he's always saying, I could have done it better. Well, actually, if you could do it better, there would probably be some sheep who would like to come hear you teach. But the fact that no one will come may be an indication. Um, we had a situation one time where we had, a, again, he wants to be teaching, he wants to be preaching. We had a guy in our church, our elders determined People did not appreciate when he taught, and we were not giving him much opportunity for various reasons. And so he came to an elder meeting one night, and this is back to last night. He read Ezekiel 34 to us and said that because we were not, you know, platforming his gifts, we were, we were abusing the sheep by depriving them of all the blessing they would have if we only gave him a more prominent role. Uh, he was welcome to pursue that elsewhere as far as we were concerned. <laughs> Um, or we've had people biding their time in your church until they can even start their own church. We have people even come and say, look, I'm planning to start a church just like this. I'm going to start a super duper new covenant church. This is not yours is not whatever I want it to be. And we're just going to be here till we can do that. And they're having everybody in your church over to try to recruit them to be part of their new thing. And on it goes. More seriously, uh, wolves, um, <laughs> Actually, before that, the, the divisive sheep. I was amazed, actually, as our church has had to deal with some people who are really being divisive, and it's heartbreaking. I started looking, again, for division in you know, synonyms of that in the New Testament. It is so much there. These are problems the early church had. It's, it's not just people who are heretics and immoral. Those are other kinds of wolves, but just people who cause divisions and in Romans 16, 17, he says, I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissension and hindrances, contrary to the teaching which you've learned. For such men are slaves, not of the Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Um, yes, that's happening. And uh, 1 Timothy 6, there's another extensive section. If anyone advocates a different doctrine, does not agree with the sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the doctrine uh, conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing, but has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, and, and evil suspicions. Uh, we've actually had someone who was trying to compare people who uh, got vaccinated to Nazis. And that you is you know, saying that taking a vaccine would be the equivalent of using the skins of Jews had been killed as lampshades or something and 
you know, those in the congregation who had gotten vaccinated probably weren't encouraged by that. Those were harsh words, unkind words. And anybody who wears a mask is a coward. I mean, obviously there are no cowards among us tonight. One, no, one and a half. We've said, by the way, to our church, we need to respect each other's views on this. We should all be humble. God is opposed to the proud, gives grace to the humble. If anything should have humbled us, it's COVID. Everybody's been wrong at some point, right? And so if somebody wants to do this or that, it's their own conscience. But just the, the judgment and the division and the judgment of leaders and of other people, um, you know, people divisive, pushing their alternative medicine things. Uh, you've, you know, traditional medicine is quackery. You've got to buy my thing and this will save your life. Um, picking fights over secondary issues. Again, the doctrinal wolf, that's... A lot of that is what Paul's warning about in Acts 20. And this has been the passage I read. Uh, we actually had this one too. You may say, you'll never want to visit our church. Um, <laughs> either of the churches I've been in the last 30 years. Um, you have men who have gone astray from the truth saying the resurrection has already taken place. I've had full preterists, both in Escondido and in Charlotte. Do you, I mean, people who say that Jesus returned in 70 AD that's the already and there is no more not yet. And we had to discipline somebody out of the church over that in Escondido. And we had to sternly warn people not to play around with this evil heresy. And they have five answers for any objection you raise, but they're still wrong. And you have to stand up and be men and deal with them. If anyone's preaching into the gospel, Paul said, let him be accursed. And then the decadent wolf, and again, all these things are right in the neighborhood. It talks about um, men who enter households that captivate weak women, weighed down with sins, led on very, by various impulses. Um, Paul talks about the immoral man, and little leaven leavens the whole lump. And again, I talked this morning about, you know, the, I've seen multiple cases where you have an immoral man or woman in a church, and they're going from bad relationship to bad relationship. Um, or people living in fornication or other such things. Um, the AWOL under shepherd. Here's somebody who's an elder in the church. You've gone to battle together. Uh, you thought they were with you to the end and suddenly they're gone. Sometimes taking other people with you. And sometimes it can be utterly shattering because you thought, I thought this person liked me. I thought this person was with me and said, well, you just, you, you know, you've lost your edge. You don't really preach like you used to. Um, well, maybe if this person doesn't have confidence in me, I'm not really called. Or if he leaves, everybody's going to leave, or a lot of people are going to leave. And then often this happens kind of in the really, the darkest hour when everything else seems to be going wrong, and then this person you were depending upon. Uh, and one piece of advice I would give, by the way, if anybody's thinking of leaving, <laughs> would be to talk about it before you do or even maybe to agree among your elders saying, you know, if one of us is struggling, we should engage before that happens. Um, and then I, the number 16 is the sugar daddy. I had to include it. You know what the sugar daddy is, right? Where you're in this church and your church has a budget of $100,000 and there's somebody who gives 70 of it. And that usually doesn't go very well, does it? You can add that to your notes if you want to. There'll be more by the time I ever give this again. Or maybe we can combine a few. But you know, the problem I've often found is very wealthy people who are the majority or a huge percentage of the church's budget often expect influence in proportion to the money they give. It doesn't have to be that way. I know very wealthy people who are generous anonymously but it's often a problem. And I've seen people go into a situation where there's a wealthy person saying, let's start a church together. But as soon as, these are often very driven, successful people who are not accustomed to people disagreeing with them successfully. And once there's a difference of opinion, all of a sudden he and his money go away and you're in trouble. So what hope do we have? We all now want to quit. Um, everybody's been covered so far. So 15 things we need to tell ourselves when we feel like quitting, 15 reasons not to quit. One is just to remember, don't be surprised. God in his kindness has given you fair warning. This comes with the territory. Um, in verse 24, 
just among many places the passage I read in 2 Timothy 2, patient when wronged, not patient if wronged. You're going to be wronged. <laughs> Bad things are going to happen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he came into his own and his own did not receive him. You know, he came into the world, the world was made by him and the world did not know him. He was despised and rejected of men. We come as his under shepherds. It's going to happen to us. Paul describes in Philippians 1 how as he was in prison, there were some who preached Christ out of envy and strife, hoping to cause him distress in his imprisonment. Can you imagine that? I mean, actually, lately, there, have been, there are people in prison in China, probably in Afghanistan, somewhere in Canada. I mean, it's bad enough to be in prison, but then for people to torment you by saying, well, you know, if you were doing the right thing, you wouldn't be in prison. Um, you look at the Old Testament, Moses, Isaiah, the prophets. I think the, you know, Isaiah 6 is such a famous passage where the glory of the Lord and his holiness and falling down, you know, and then he says, who will go? And Isaiah says, I will go. Here I am. Send me. And then the Lord says, and you're going to go and you're going to speak and they're not going to listen. <laughs> How long? <laughs> we have a much better gig than Isaiah did. There's nobody here who's got as bad a gig as Isaiah did. Don't be surprised. Um, sadly, if you pull out on January 1st, your church directory, if you have one, and you go down the directory, some of those people will be gone by the end of the year. And some of them are the ones that you never imagined would leave. And they're leave for reasons you never would have thought they would have left. And sometimes there'll be nothing you can do to turn it around. For that matter, the harder you try, the more discouraged you'll become. Romans 12, 18, as far as it's possible with you to be at peace with all men, give it a shot. If you, can't, you can't restore every relationship. Actually, one of my cards over there you may want to pick up when we're done is, called, is a rejection card. <laughs> because that's what it feels like. When people leave, it feels like you've been broken up with. I've had people leave the church before and they say, you know, I'd still like to get together every week with you. I'm thinking, you just broke up with me. <laughs> I didn't leave you, you left me. And I've got 200 other people who need my attention. You already decided you don't, want, you, know, you don't want to be part of our church. I didn't say any of that to the person. I didn't say, I'm going to be really busy. It's not that I don't want to be your friend, but it hurts. It can feel very personal. And sometimes it is, and sometimes it's because of our weaknesses. I've had people leave because I said stupid things. I said foolish things with careless things. Keep watch over your own soul. Some of this Brian has already covered, which is to your benefit. <laughs> so I won't talk as long. I can do it more quickly. Again, in the, in the chapter I read, uh, flee youthful lust, you know that. But the positive side, we, we usually stop. I, I used to think verse 22 ended with lusts. Flee youthful lusts. Actually, there's a put on that's bigger than the put off. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Um... If you walk by the Spirit, you won't carry out the desires of the flesh. We, we need to be walking in the Spirit. And so many of the deeds of the flesh are relational. Outbursts of anger, envy, strife. Uh, the verse before is if you, you don't bite and devour each other. He's warning. And so how you need to be walking with the Lord very closely. It's very When people slander you, when people betray you, you want to fight back. You want to return fire. You want to defend and counterattack. And the passions aren't just sexual lust. They can be the, the passion of you feel genuinely physically hot in the face of this. And you need to have the self-control the Spirit gives you as you watch over yourself. And then just, you know, we're supposed to be Calvinists here. Remember that God is sovereign. He's also just. And here's part of the problem. Again, face it, okay? If a bunch of people leave... This is going to affect me a lot, right? If enough of them leave, I won't have a job anymore, or they will not be able to pay me anymore. If enough people leave, I will appear to be a failure to everybody else. Because I've got a tiny church or a church that died. I have fear because if these people think this church isn't worth staying in, and I'm not worth listening to, Maybe lots of other people will feel it. So we've got all these fears. We have insecurities. Maybe I really am worthless. 
Maybe I really am not gifted, not called. Um, and so, again, we remember God allowed his son to be rejected, reviled, betrayed, and abandoned. Uh, this is where David, you know, David in 2 Samuel 16, after Shimei curses him and Abishai wants to behead Shimei, David says, verse 10, What have I to do with you, O sons of Zariah? If he curses and if the Lord has told him to curse David, then who shall say, Why have you done this all? And in verse 12, Perhaps the Lord will look on my affliction and return good to me instead of cursing this day. So David employed his theology in a very difficult situation. And he says, rather than taking revenge on the person who has grievously wronged me, um, I believe God is sovereign. He has allowed this and he is just. And it's his job to deal with Shimei, not my job to deal with Shimei. And God allows suffering for a good reason. He, again, no one has suffered more than his son. And that was with cause. And that had a good outcome. I, one of the most mysterious verses in all the Bible to me. I think it's Hebrews 5.8 where it says that in his humanity our Lord had to learn through the things he suffered. <laughs> that his the fullness of his humanity it was always perfect humanity and yet he had to be in a sense completed by what he went through so that he could do what he needed to do and be who he needed to be in the fullness of his humanity. Just like he had to grow up from a baby to a man. He had to grow up as a man through suffering we have to do that too. They're just thing. If, if there were lessons Jesus couldn't learn about suffering, probably true of you as well. And he told him, by the way, if you want to follow him, it's called taking up a cross. And then we have to just trust God for the future. We have to trust God that if he wants us to have a congregation and an income and a reputation, he will take care of that. And if he chooses to bless another ministry, that's his business as well. And at the end of John 21, where uh, Peter's saying, yeah, what about John here? What are you going to do with him? And Jesus is like, you know, what I do with him is none of your business. Uh, do your thing. That's New Living Translation modified. <laughs> <laughs> Which gets to how you have to find your security in the Lord and not people. I counsel a lot of pastors who are really struggling in their churches and pressures like this really, you know, Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man brings a snare. But the one who trusts in God will be safe. The one who trusts in God will be exalted. And all of this, and I'm not here as the guy who doesn't fear people. You know, I worry what people are going to think of me or if I'm going to get in trouble or people will leave or whatever. I, I struggle with that. And this, this brings that out. And it forces me to find my security in the Lord. You know, when Paul says to the Galatians, I think in chapter 1, verse 11, am I trying to please men or God? If I was trying to please men, again, paraphrase, I would do things differently. <laughs> and so you know, we're, we're, we have to focus on pleasing God and trusting him again. He's delivered you before. He's been good to you before. And you want in your conscience to say, as best I could, I handled this situation in a manner that pleased him. Even when I was wrong, Okay, I sought forgiveness of God. I, I was humble and received correction. But our, again, our aim has to be to please him and not people. And the rejection of people often exposes our people pleasingness, which, by the way, can also lead to massive burnout when you have 150 bosses or even 50 bosses and you feel like you have to keep them all happy all the time. Bad for your marriage. Um, which brings me to the next point. Protect your family. Protect your wife. Um, when there is strife in the church, when you're receiving criticism, when things are hard, when people are leaving, there's some wives who can take more than others. It's not the same for everybody. We're supposed to live with our wives, 1 Peter 3, 7, in an understanding way. And there are some wives who can come alongside of you and you can tell her almost everything and she can be your wise counselor. The teaching of wisdom is on her lips. She does you good and not evil all the days of her life, your life. And there's some that you may have to shelter from some of the worst of what you're having to deal with because it would just be overwhelming to them. I've seen many cases where the pastor who's under attack is able to manage it and his wife goes on the warpath. Not helpful, generally speaking. Where she takes up the offense more than he did. And so another aspect is that it goes back to the people pleasing. As I was another pastor in our area, a pastor, we'll call him Joe. Um, 
he and his wife probably married 30, 35 years. He's been in ministry in a small church. And he actually pours, he absolutely pours his life into these people. Somebody calls, Joe comes running. Anybody needs him, he comes. He lives right by the church in the parsonage. They can come anytime, day or night. He's there for them. There's one person he's not there for, and she's pretty unhappy. And, uh, but again, it's, part of it was what's in his heart, not just what is he doing wrong, but why is he doing it? Well, he, he's trying to please people. He wants those people to be pleased with him, and so he just jumps whenever they say she becomes his margin. He's not pleasing God. And he has to rearrange his priorities to make his wife the priority because he's not qualified to be a pastor if that marriage is not going well. And then just refuse to quarrel. Uh, lots in the New Testament and in Proverbs about quarreling. This was in the passage I read earlier. Refuse foolish and ignorant speculations knowing that they produce quarrels. Uh, James 1, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. I actually had... A couple situations recently where people said things to me that were extremely discouraging and upsetting to me. And I knew I had an obligation before God to confront it. And I actually took four to seven days to calm down, be slow to speak, very slow to speak, to pray about it, to talk it over with Caroline as to what would be the, and sought other counsel about what would be the wisest way to do what I knew I had to do. Uh, the first thing that comes to your mind probably isn't the best thing. Another aspect, I'll tell you how we're handling this, trying to handle this COVID thing in our church. We've got people who want us to listen to hour long videos of people saying that vaccines are the devil or masks are the devil or vice versa. Again, it's, that's not the point. And I, I've been working with others that the issue here is not whether we tell the whole church not to get vaccinated or tell them. We've told them it's their freedom. The issue here is you have divisive people who, are, who want to quarrel with us and want us to spend hours and hours going through all their reasons for this, that, or the other while they are being callously, brutally insensitive to those who differ with them. In Proverbs 26, 12, do you see a man who's wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Okay. I don't want to create my own quarrel tonight, but I'm going to take a bit of a risk. None of us knows for sure where this is going in the next year, two years, or five years. I'm not sure whether the people who got vaccinated will regret it or not. And if somebody says they are sure, I'm not very confident in that assertion. We need to be humble, but I think, you know, in our church, our, so the issue here is not who's right and wrong, but who's quarrelsome? <laughs> and we just need to not engage sometimes. Just ignore things. It's a glory to overlook a matter, the proverb says. And this is the famous chapter from Spurgeon's lectures to my students where he says, a minister ought to have one blind eye and one deaf ear. And he says, especially when it comes to opinions and remarks about yourself. <laughs> He says, in cases of false reports about yourself, for the most part, use the deaf ear. Your blameless life will be your best defense. Abstain from fighting your own battles. And in nine cases out of ten, your accusers will gain nothing by their malevolence. Now, there are exceptions, he says. There are times when public charges are made and you have to answer them. Ideally, you have, this will be another point, fellow elders who can do that with you and for you. Um, to all honest and just remarks, we are bound to give due measure of heed, but to the bitter verdict of prejudice, the frivolous fault finding of men of fashion, the stupid utterances of the ignorant and fierce denunciation of opponents, we may safely turn a deaf ear. I love in Philippians 1, where Paul is an apostle. He's in prison. And there are people who are trying to cause him distress in his imprisonment. And he says, if Christ is proclaimed, I rejoice. He doesn't say, I'm an apostle, shut those guys up. In Galatians, when they're preaching false doctrine, he says, shut those guys up. Amazing self-control. So be patient when wronged. Don't, you don't need to counterattack. That's 20, verse 24. We've already talked about that. Um, somebody talked about even a 24-hour rule. You get an email. Somebody says something. Rarely will you regret pausing for a while to 
calm down. I'll leave it at that. Uh, be kind. Um, again, in my Bible reading in Luke 6.35, read it many times, but there's a particular word in this passage that got me when I read it most recently. Jesus said, love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return for your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High for he himself is kind to ungrateful ungrateful men and evil men. There, that, that, that's sometimes what really gets you. By the way, it also gets parents with adult kids. They're so ungrateful. I poured out my heart. I did all these things. And then they would say this, do this, abandon me, whatever it may be. God is very kind to ungrateful people like me <laughs> and you. And we get to be like him by being kind. Uh, one time I was in a situation where it was actually in the inaugural meeting to discuss the possible formation of fire in 1999. And there was another Reformed Baptist group that wanted to plant a church in our county. And when I talked to their leader, he says, well, we know you're there. We respect you. We're going to try to be as far away from you as possible. There's an Oceanside 20 miles away. San Diego's 25 miles. Well, they planted like two-tenths, well, half a mile away. <laughs> and I didn't like that at the time. I felt I had been lied to. It hurt. And of course, it's because we weren't right in their eyes. But so we have this meeting, and people are getting paid off, paired off to pray for each other like we do here. I'm leading the meeting, and somehow the last person to be prayed for is the pastor of this new church being planted in my backyard to compete with my church from my sinful perspective. And the last person who needed to pray for somebody was me. In front of like 75 people, I had to pray for him. It was really good for me. <laughs> uh, tried to keep doing it after that day. Uh, to be kind. Uh, by the way, sometimes when people leave, they come back and they apologize. I've had people do that too. When you're kind. Respond humbly to critics. Baruch talked a lot about this. A verse I love for this, Proverbs 9, 8. I may get the order wrong, but if you rebuke a scoffer, he will hate you. If you rebuke a wise man, he will love you. And you know, this is kind of David, how he took the criticism from Shimei, that you may learn something even from an immature or weak critic. Um, <laughs> on the positive side, we had a lady in our church who was in her early 70s and very social, very friendly. I think she really loved me. And one Sunday, I'm, my mind's always doing this. I'm probably doing this all the time while I'm here. I'm thinking in, in church, I walked right by her. And she grabbed me. She said, you just walked right by me without greeting me. And she let me have it. <laughs> and you know, at that time, I wasn't as close to her age as I am now. And just for her, it was very important that I slow down, make eye contact, be me. And it just revealed to me my weaknesses, that I'm, you know, I'm thinking about my sermon and five other things I got to do. And boom, that was helpful. Sometimes they're not so helpful. Uh, Baruch made the comment that critics will tell you things, true things that your friends will not. As Spurgeon writes, a sensible friend who will unsparingly criticize you from week to week will have, be a far greater blessing to you than a thousand undiscriminating, undiscriminating admirers if you have sense enough to bear his treatment and grace enough to be thankful for it. Um, ask question. Help me understand what you're saying. Of course, the reality is I'm actually much worse than you know. Being chief of sinners as I am, God may use this trial to help me grow in grace. Um, Paul Tripp writes, we are addicted to the pursuit of self-glory. Lloyd-Jones says, the man who is truly meek is the one who is amazed that God, that God and man can think of him as well as they do and treat them as well as they do. We're almost done. Almost. Remember that they are Christ's sheep and not yours. Acts 20, 28, he bought, the Lord bought this flock with his own blood. He is the chief shepherd. And this is kind of the funny thing. When people come to your church from the Arminian church, the Charismatic church, the Catholic church, the Methodist church, they come to your church, do you accept them? Well, of course, they're doing the right thing, true? We're perfectly happy to accept people from other churches, even the pretty reformed church, but not as good as you church that they come from. Well, sometimes it goes the other way. 
and we just have to accept that. I love the quote, I think it's Calvin speaking of John the Baptist in John 3 when he said, he must increase, I must decrease. The job, our job as pastors is not, we're the friend of the bridegroom. Our job is not to steal the bride. Our job is to unite the bride and the groom. And that may involve them going to another church. And then sometimes the wolves must be confronted. And Brian talked about that some as well. Um, some of us dislike conduct, conflict. Like I said, in our church, we had to, con we had to confront the people who were dabbling with full preterism and other such things. So sometimes you have to confront immoral people and even though it's very uncomfortable. Sometimes the flock may be blessed through a departure. We, we always want to make it work, but if someone is divisive or teaching false doctrine or spreading immorality, if they gotta go, we may be better off in the long run, or if they just don't want what we're doing. If they're trying to change us into something we're not. Um, and this is actually an approach I was talking to my fellow elders yesterday, is certain people are all mad because we're not handling COVID exactly the way they want. And said, if you can't respect us and the way we're doing things, then maybe you need to find some elders you can respect more. I happen to know they don't have a chance, but let them try if they don't want to respect our leadership. Another very important one is don't bear the burdens alone. There are plural elders in every church. Christ is the chief shepherd. We bear one another's burdens. It's really hard when people criticize you or leave not to take it personally, to feel like a failure, to feel rejected. I'm thinking now of my PCA friend, you know, and you're trying to think, well, maybe this church would be better off without me or the criticism that, you know, people criticize your preaching. You know, the elders, your fellow elders have been given the duty collectively to shepherd the flock. They're the ones I think have the primary responsibility to determine whether you're qualified or not to determine whether your preaching is edifying or not, rather than some uncommitted critic who wants to blast you. And so I would rely upon them very heavily. I also would rely upon them, and speaking to fellow elders, that if someone needs to answer the critics, if someone needs to defend you, it's much better if you are defensible for them to try to deal with that rather than to be in the position of defending yourself. But you know, sometimes I would get criticized, said, help me evaluate this criticism. Maybe it's valid, maybe it's not. Sometimes I thought it might have some validity. Um, you want the most mature and godly men in the congregation to uh, help you. Interestingly, even in David's case, when he was on the run, part of the context in the Shimei passage is he had a few loyal friends who stuck with him, even at great risk to himself. If you feel like quitting, they're the ones who are best qualified to determine whether you're right or wrong about that. And if your fellow elders believe you're still called, which is the external call to the church, you know, it, Acts 20 says, God has made you, the Lord has made you overseers through the means of the church doing that. And if that call continues and the, the church through its leaders believe that you are gifted and called, then the critics are not the determiners of that. Um, and then something very hopeful, and I, I, this is a piece of advice that I think many of us need tonight. It's so easy if you have, I mean, this actually happened to me when I came to RTS five years ago in my first semester. There were a lot of people there who did not like biblical counseling and wished I would get on a plane and go back to California. And they were critical in some of them in kind of nasty ways, and it, it really hurt. But I hadn't, you know, I'd been in a place for 26 years where people kind of liked me and I hadn't had a lot of that for a while from, you know, lots of people. Um, but what the Lord also gave me was a larger handful of people whose lives were being transformed and were so excited. And I think it's so important when things are hard to look at what, how God has used you and used the church. You get your focus off of those who are probably gone anyway Stop chasing them. Stop pleading with them. You probably will never satisfy them anyway. And make a, an earnest focus on those in the past and the present where God has used the church and your ministry to build them up. Paul does this some. He calls people, you are my joy and my crown. John talks about people, I have no greater joy than to know that my children walk in the truth. In, in 3 John, I think verse 4. And, and this is a wonderful meditation. If God has called you to ministry, 
to just force yourself. Maybe your spouse or your fellow elders can help you just to recall even now, instead of your, your eyes on the grumblers and the complainers and the backbiters and the people you can't ever keep happy anyway, there are people who are listening to your preaching. There are people who are understanding who God is for the first time in their lives. There are people who want to spend time with you. There, there are marriages that have been restored by the gospel as you've shared that with them and you've borne their burdens. And so put your focus, as, as Paul sometimes would, on, on where God is working and stop, choose Philippians 4. Think about things that are good and profitable. You know, whatever is true and good and right and honorable, dwell on these things. And then, uh, I'll say in a qualified way, don't quit. Don't give up. In the beginning of the chapter, I read a long chapter at the beginning, but it's interesting when Paul gives the analogies of what life is like in the ministry, um, he says, well, you could be a soldier, an athlete, or a farmer. Those are all jobs that require perseverance. Those are all jobs, and sometimes the, the, the results are delayed, farmer especially. Uh, you have to keep going as long as you believe yourself to be called. I think there can be a time when you quit. Okay, when do you quit? If the church no longer thinks you're called, whether they're right or wrong, it's probably time to go. If you don't have the support of the church, and it may be they just don't believe what you believe or whatever, it may be you've become thoroughly convinced there's a place you can be much more useful. And I never imagined I would leave our church in California. I became convinced from using, thinking about Psalm 90, teach me to number my days. I was 58 years old. If I had 10, 15 more years, where could I be most productive? And I became convinced the hard change was the best thing. I think that's normally rare. But don't just give up because you're tired. Do you really think it's going to be easier in the next place? <laughs> you're a farmer. You're a soldier. You're an athlete. The Olympics are a long ways off. <laughs> and I love it. You get Hebrews 12, how... Uh, run with endurance the race that is set before you, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him. He endured the shame, despised the shame, unto the point of the cross. He says, you've not yet suffered to the point of shedding blood, and you're striving against sin. So for most of us, the answer is God has called us to endure it as Christ endured. Again, there can be cases where you have another calling, or where you realize this isn't your calling. That's where you're Fellow leaders can help you, but generally speaking, um, we persist. And I'll close with a quote from Calvin, which I don't think is on one of those comics yet. The ministry is not an easy or indulgent exercise, but a hard and severe warfare where Satan is exerting all his power against us and moving every stone for our disturbance. And you guys chose to do this. <laughs> May God help us to graciously deal with now the 16 people who make us want to quit and to endure for at least 15 reasons. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have given us in your word everything we need to be equipped for the work to which you've called us, including hard things of rejection, discouragement, um, slander, brokenheartedness over relationships. I don't know the situation of each of my brothers and sisters here, but I'm sure that many are remembering hard things from the past that are painful to recall. Many are going through difficulties now. Father, if you have called us and appointed us to these things, help us to endure and not to lose heart. Help us to walk in the path of Christ, which is a hard path. Help us to be gracious. Help us to help each other. Help us, Lord, grant us that we could lead churches which are holy and united, which are lights. Thank you for seasons of peace. Help us to put our ultimate hope in you and not in people. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.